Alrighty, we're to start. All right, thank you all for coming. Um, this is a great website you made before the first line of code is written, Driving Strategy with Human Centered Design. This is not the session you intended to come to. You're stuck because I can't afford to lose anybody. Not that many of you here. <laughs> I'm not letting you out. Um, so let's uh, do the housekeeping stuff. By now, I think we all know where the code of conduct is. This is the fourth time we've seen the slide, but it is super important. So we will mention it one more time. And of course, if you're around tomorrow afternoon for contribution day, one of these times I will schedule myself properly so I can actually stay and do this, but not this weekend. I actually thought this was a Friday, Saturday camp when I booked my flight. <laughs> so I have an early morning flight home tomorrow. I can't read a website apparently. So, um, But yeah, if you're around, definitely, as, as they've tried to uh, reiterate, this is not something where you have to be a developer. I mean, there's always you know, proofreading documentation and testing and all kinds of things that can be done that don't require you to know the first thing about how to build a website. Okay, so who am I? I built my first website on actually New Year's Eve, 1231, 1995. Um, my wife was like seven and a half months pregnant and went to bed very early and it was New Year's Eve and I was bored so I decided to learn HTML. Um, I turned that night, um, essentially copying the code off like IBM.com probably and changing the stuff between the tags, that's what I did I think. I um, went to a job with a web design firm in 1996, and I have worked at some level of web technology ever since, um, kind of making the entire cycle from agencies. I sold some servers back in dot-com one. I went into hosting for a while. I was into content syndication. I took a five-year break and sold web-based accounting software. Uh, came back to web dev in 2012 and hooked up with the Drupal shop in 2014. So now we're like six years in the Drupal world. Um, even though my job is basically sales and marketing. I did pass the Aqua at Drupal 8 site builder test, um, but I would not recommend anyone ever hire me to build a website. <laughs> it's kind of like academic knowledge. I could read the manual and, under, and memorize the answers, but you, know, you really don't want me making decisions about information architecture. Um, there's my contact info if you want to get a hold of me afterwards. Um, just because people always ask about our company name, it's uh, Promet Source and it's from Prometheus of Greek mythology. Um, who are you? Um, curious, who's more of a developer type, right? And who's more of a designer, kind of non-coder, project manager type? Yeah, that's why you do these sessions. <laughs> um, that's good, that's good. I mean, it's, it's really targeted at both. I mean, I think it's good for the developers to understand kind of what's going on before they, have to, they sometimes start to see project plans and sprint plans. Um, so where some of those decisions came from. So um, the, the basic, sort of basic point of this presentation is that the most finely tuned, greatest, smoothest, agile process you could possibly have can't save the project if the project was a bad idea in the first place. Um, and the whole goal of human-centered design is to make sure that we come out of the design the, um, strategy phase with a good idea, with a, with, a, with a website that's being designed to solve real problems for the real users that the client or the internal team, whoever, has identified going into the project. Um, and that we're not designing the site for the designers, which happens occasionally. Um, so by doing that, in theory, you, know, you come out of the, the planning process with the user needs understood and documented and built to those user needs, the end product should work. Um, so technical definition of human centered design. Design is just the discipline of generating essentially new stuff to solve problems. I want to super simplify it. Human centered design, um, which is actually a trademark term of the Lumen Institute, by the way, um, is basically doing that, but with a laser focus on identifying who your users are and what they want from the product. I know this sounds like the most obvious thing in the world. Um, did anybody else fly to this camp beside me? Okay, someone's flown coach recently, right? Is there anything about the, the whole process of getting to the airport, getting on an airplane and flying that feels like they cared about us when you designed the process, right? Or if you, um, if, you, if you had to update your license for the new um, federal ID standards, I mean, that entire process, especially for women, where they have to like, you know, prove their last name from 30 years ago, um, <laughs> because they, they don't trust you've been married for 25 years. They want to see the wedding certificate. My wife had to go find ours, you know, and buried in a box somewhere to prove that she married me. 1991. Um, so really, this whole process of human-centered design and thinking about users doesn't happen nearly as often as it should. Um, probably because people think it's expensive, but really it saves you money because it keeps you from making bad decisions, like putting this seat to your plane 28 inches apart, um, Spirit Airlines. Um, 
Okay. So why do we do this? From a web design agency IT standpoint, um, there's a couple of things we get out of this human-centered design practice. Um, you get greater client engagement, and the client, in the case of permanent source, can actually be a paying customer. Uh, if you work for the state of Florida, it can be the internal team that's working together. Um, <coughs> Especially like in government and higher ed where they're very kind of bureaucratic and there might be 40 separate groups that have some say in the website. Um, the finance department may not really have a whole lot going on with the website. It might just be a two page of the contact info. Um, however, if you don't get their input up front, you don't get them involved, they can stop the project dead cold six months in if they don't think their concerns were heard. Um, so by doing this process, and we'll kind of get into the details in a minute, you make sure that you get everybody sort of that has a stake in the project gets their say early um, when it's easy and cheap to change things because you haven't even installed Drupal Core yet, let alone actually start building a website. Um, kind of same thing with the stakeholders. Um, you sort of get them all on the same page up front before you spend any money building stuff. Um, and from a pro net, and from a, you know, an agency standpoint, um, you know, this process is basically, in the real world, it's three to four days in a room full of whiteboards usually with, our, with the client team whiteboarding out stuff. So we learn way more than we ever could have known just from the RFP or from the initial conversation with the sales team about what they really want and need. Um, you know, it's guaranteed that, that what you think you're going to build going into these sessions is never what happens on the other side because you learn so much new information about what they really need. Um, so, I mean, from a more businessy standpoint, you're reducing risk. Again, if in theory, if we know what the users want and we build the website for those users, the user should be happy with the website and it should work and that reduces risk. Anytime you reduce risk, you reduce cost. That's kind of obvious. Um, you also tame complexity because again, you make all your decisions up front when you're just working with wireframes and whiteboards and post-it notes um, when it's easy and cheaper to change things. And then kind of building on what I said a few minutes ago, um, especially in a big bureaucratic organization, you get the finance department and the IT department and the marketing department in a room together. That probably doesn't actually happen very often in these organizations. Um, so you get them all working together on something which helps the project succeed farther on down the line. Okay. So how do we do this? Um, as I mentioned before, it's literally getting a bunch of people in a, in a room full of whiteboards usually and, and, and hashing things out. Um, but it's a very structured process. Um, the Luma Institute training um, has like 150 different exercises that come, that come out of it that you can use um, to sort of elicit what you, the information you're trying to gather um, from the project team. In reality, I think most organizations or groups end up with like the sort of eight to 10 of those exercises that they feel like work for them and they get really good at it. I know ProMet, we sort of have our favorite six or so that we focus on most of the time, but there's a huge universe of exercises you could use to sort of draw information out of people sometimes that um, aren't good at giving information or aren't good at working together. Well, so the things we're trying to do example? here. Hmm? What would be an example? Um, we're actually going to do an example. Oh, okay. Two slides. We're actually going to, we're actually going to fix Drupal today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're trying to identify stakeholders, right? You're trying to figure out who actually has a stake in the website. Um, both, again, you know, from a client, a client standpoint, your customers if it's an e-commerce site or your constituents if it's a government site. But also internally, like the content editors, they have needs. You know, they, they need to be able to get their content into the site and understand the admin interface you're giving them. If they don't, then it doesn't work for them. And they, you know, they're just as important as the customer in a lot of ways. Um, and the reality is you are trying to prioritize these stakeholders too. Because from a website, a website standpoint, they're not all equal. Some of them are going to have, you know, be able to do much more of their job or, or be able to do things with the website. Other people won't care as much. Um, it was popular 10 years ago, especially with government websites, and, you, and a lot of them are still this way. There's literally like 180 links in the mega menu to every possible government department. They recreated the org chart. That was a failure to prioritize your stakeholders. That was, we don't want to have, have to make a decision about whether or not this little department with one person in it deserves a link on the home page, so everybody gets a link on the home page. So yeah, you solve the internal argument, you've made life miserable for the website user trying to figure out where to go. Um, you're trying to identify strengths, problems, opportunities in the current website, or again, this is this goes against websites. You could be doing product development, you could be, you know, designing the process of the DMV, but you're just trying to figure out what works and what doesn't, and how you're doing things now and then how you can transfer that to the new system and make it better. Um, then, then basically, this is all sort of information gathering, right? We're getting all this input from, from the client team. 
Um, so then we start to group and relate these things together, which I'll, sh I'll show you that in a minute, um, and try to figure out, okay, we have you know, 85 post-it notes on a wall of problems, but when you really look at it holistically, there's like six major issues here, and these are all different expressions of the six major issues. Um, once you have the problem, it's time to figure out the solution. Um, so then you look at some exercises to actually start to brainstorm, okay, now that we've identified our six major issues with the current Drupal 7 website, how can we fix them in Drupal 8? Um, and coming out of that, you then have to prioritize your solutions, because again, they're not all equal, some are going to be more important, some are going to be maybe too expensive to actually fix in this cycle, because you're going to need you know, a major capital investment or something to, to do that integration on the back end. Um, so coming out of that, then you prioritize your solutions, and your prioritized solution list is essentially your user story list to go, go forward with an agile development at that point. That's how we do it. Um, so why does this actually work? Why do we come out of these sessions with the clients with a great project plan? Um, you're forcing everybody in the room to think about the users, which again, just doesn't happen as often as it should because everyone's in a hurry, everyone's got 85 hours of work to do each week. But you're forcing everyone to stop for two to four days in those cases on, on a large kind of government website project and think about who's using the site, why are they using it, how can we make their life better, and at the same time make our life better internally by doing this. Um, you're then validating all these assumptions you make about your users. Because you're, you know, you're starting off with assumptions, or maybe even they tell you we want to do X on the website. We all know what people say and what they do. It doesn't always match up. So then you're going to validate this stuff through user testing, prototyping, those types of things. Um, and then you actually are solving the problems that you've now spent a lot of time and effort to really document and identify. Um, so what's it look like in real life? Um, first thing we usually do is um, it's what we call stakeholder mapping. And it's literally just trying to draw out um, who the stakeholders are in the website. This is actually when we built at DrupalCon Seattle last year. Um, we had a whiteboard up at our, our booth and just had, had people come and list you know, who the stakeholders were of the web, of a Drupal website and their organization. Um, and then we, and then, you know, our, our uh, creative director sort of drew it up pretty, but you got you know, content editors, developers, designers on the internal side, um, people working with salesforce.com, you're getting data from your website. And then outside of your internal organization, you've got your customers, your partners, the general public, so forth. Um, you know, from that, you then build user personas. So you pick, depending on the number of stakeholders, if you have four or five, you can do a persona for all of them. If you've identified 13, you probably have to prioritize um, and pick the pick the ones that are most representative of the people that are coming to the website. If you're building a higher education website, you know, the, the .edu, .edu site is almost always 100% focused on recruiting high school juniors and seniors. Or maybe for, you know, for like, for a technical college, that's probably a broader group, because they're probably also going after second career people, you know, more of a non-traditional student audience. But it's generally about student recruitment. So, you know, your user persona then, um, you know, might, might be a, you know, and you're, and you're literally going to draw it and you know, kind of create the state person to keep it in your head who you're designing for. Mike's, uh, you know, if it's, um, say if it's UF or FSU, to make sure I get both sides and insult anybody. Um, you know, it's a high achieving high school junior, senior, GPA is 3.8 or higher, he's in leadership, he plays a sport, you know, you kind of check box all the high achieving student stuff. That's what those schools are going after. Whereas, again, the, you know, the student persona for, for a technical is probably a little broader. You know, second career people, um, adults returning to college and they were finished um, when they started and so forth. Other personas for a higher education site, right, the parents. Yeah, you're going to kind of go through that process too. Same thing, sort of model out who the, who the parent is, what they're like. Um, alumni, maybe. Oftentimes alumni have their websites, so they don't really care for the main.edu site. Uh, the general community, you know, higher education always wants to be a good partner. Um, in town, so you're going to kind of focus on the business owners around the university, then depending upon students and that sort of thing. And you're just going to sort of model out, you know, who they are, demographics, age, income. Most of this, uh, on, a lot of this generally is, is more just sort of general guessing. You're not going to do a ton of research on this because mo most organizations sort of know who their customers are. And you know, the university, I mean, I'm sure they can tell you here down to the dollar, you know, <laughs> the average income, age of people coming in. So, but you're just documenting it all with a, you know, with a stock photo usually. Um, just to make it easier as you work through the, pro the project for the next you know, three to eight months, 
when you think about the user, the high school student, you can think about Mike, you can picture him, um, and it just sort of builds that connection in the brains of the designers and the developers a little tighter. After personas, we usually go into an exercise called Rose Thorn Bud, and we will do this exercise in a few minutes. Um, it's basically a brain, it's kind of a structured brainstorming exercise, and we're going to do it in a minute, so I won't go into detail. Um, after Rose Thorn Bud, which essentially what we're doing is identifying positives in the current system, negatives in the current system, and opportunities for improvement in the current system, um, or things we're not doing at all yet. Um, then we are going to cluster them, um, try to, you know, figure out where we're going. Again, this is actually the cluster from um, our, our Drupal 8 exercise at, at Seattle. Um, so you can see the roses are good, um, the blues are negatives, and the greens are, um, are the opportunities that we haven't really addressed yet. I thought this was surprising because my personal perception of Drupal 8 was that the back end was stronger than the front end, but the people, DrupalCon Seattle sort of you know, generally, they, well, the ones that came by our booth anyway, I don't know if they're really a representative of group of the audience, sort of other way, right? They sort of see the front end of Drupal Blade as being the strength, and that the back end has a lot of opportunities for fixed things, which is sort of backwards, I would guess. So, you know, you're always learning when you do this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, from then, you go into something we call statement starters, which are, are literally writing um, fixes or statements on how we can improve the process. Um, and then you basically build a matrix of all your um, all your solution statements, and you break them down into essentially difficulty, which is usually dollars in most cases, how, how expensive it'll be, and also the importance on the x-axis. Um, so the stuff that doesn't cost much, but is important, is what you're going to basically fix first or build first. Um, the, you know, the low-hanging fruit, you know, you sort of mix it into the sprints, it doesn't really matter. The luxury items oftentimes aren't going to be part of the sprint plan because they're expensive and not very important. And then the strategic items are expensive and important. That might be phase two because frequently in the real world that's going to require some kind of additional budget allocation if they didn't think about that stuff before they budgeted for the project. Um, but you know these little sticky notes essentially become your project plan. They become your task list to build out the, the sprint plan for the website. So let's try it. We're going to do Rose, Rose Thorn Bud first. Um, if you point your laptop or phone at tinyurl.com slash fldrupalcamp. Yeah, oops, go up one. Yeah, fldrupalcamp. And it'll look like, should get to the screen right here. It's our fun metro board. Um, let's just take like, I don't know, three, four minutes and just sort of brainstorm. The problem I came up with was Drupal 8 as a government website platform. Um, and you can, uh, tinyurl.com slash FL Drupal Camp. All one word. Um, and then if you just click the pluses, you can just start adding sticky notes to the list. Um, let's just brainstorm things that are good about Drupal 8 as a government website platform things that are bad, the thorns, and then, you know, the buds are the opportunities um, that we haven't really done anything about yet. Places where we can grow Drupal as a government, make it better as a government than a website platform. And I'll add a couple too. Try to add at least, you know, one to each line. This is no fun if we have 25 roses and no thorns, even though you know, it's easy to think positive sometimes. And don't worry about what's already up there. The fact that we get five of the same thing is good. That just tells us we're all thinking the same thing on certain things. If you don't have your phone handy or a laptop, I want to just shout them out or I can add them for you too.
30 more seconds. By the way, this is exactly how we do it with, with clients when we're doing a remote. If we're not in person, if we do a remote, sometimes just for logistics, we end up doing this with, with uh, you know, WebEx or Zoom. Speaking of FSU. <laughs> what, what's this website, Fun? It's called Fun Retro. Fun Retro. Dot, dot IO. Yeah, it's just an yeah. online collaboration tool. Um, but when we do this with clients, we have to do remote. This, what we're doing here is exactly how we do it. Okay, um, what we have. So, for positives about Drupal 8 for government, obviously open source, lack of um, licensing costs, security, flexibility, modules that are reusable solutions, ability to integrate other things, so probably none of that's a surprise. Those are all sort of the standard benefits of Drupal. Some of the thorns, training costs, you have the Drupal 7, Drupal 8 into life thing coming up, definitely an issue. Um, overhead of maintaining a healthy system, that was mine. Um, getting started, migration, learning curve, high startup costs, so we got people thinking the same there. Um, you know, de developing on Drupal can be expensive, yep. Um, open source security FUD, that was mine. I still hear from government people, especially occasionally, that they can't consider open source because it's not secure. I mean, I, hear, I, hear, I heard that in 2019 a few times still. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, module, you know, modules are a, a, a rose and they also can be a thorn because, you know, they can, they can um, fall apart and not be maintained and so forth. Um, some of the buds, some of the opportunities, um, distributions was mine. I still think there's a, a big opportunity to have, especially for like public sector, essentially a website in a box, um, either download or someone could be doing it as a SaaS, as a, as a cheap SaaS service. Um, you know, click a button and essentially you've got a county government website or a, um, you know, fishing game website or whatever the case may be, sort of just ready to go. We have to use that content. Um, Long-term compatibility, yep, documentation. Um, it's flexible for creating unique designs, computing involvement. Um, it's both a strength and an opportunity, yep, segmentation. So, I think you kind of sense now if you're doing this internal group or if you're an agency doing with a client, you start to see, you know, the power of sort of just some focused brainstorming up front. Um, to kind of figure out what problems you're trying to solve. Oops. Back to the okay. Um, if we had, when I do this with 25, 30 people, we then go vote up on the. You can vote on the board to get the three or four to talk about. There wasn't really enough of us here to bother voting. We just went through them all. So we'll skip that slide. Um, but you know, in a, in a client situation with 30 people in the room, you do have to sort of go back and figure out which ones will you know, start to combine them into repeats and stuff. Um, what we typically do, and honestly, you probably won't do it on this one again because we don't have enough data, is our creative director takes the data I, co I come out of this with and writes up a blog post, what we learned. Um, although this is like the sixth or seventh time I've done this presentation, I have to be honest with you, the blog posts are getting kind of repetitive. <laughs> We're not really learning a whole lot new anymore at this point. Um, um, so statement starters, this would be the next thing we would do. We would do the, we would cluster them down to like, you know, so here's our issues with um, content input, here's our issues with integration, whatever they may be, and then you do statement starters. So you basically are saying, okay, we can do X to fix this. We can, um, you know, if, let's say we're doing this at the Drupal Association, for whatever reason, we're, we're helping them with something. And on the documentation problem, right, we could say, okay, we can create a committee focused on recruiting documentation volunteers in the next two months, or whatever the case may be. Um, and you just simply, go back to our board, and, and the way we do this in the real world is we basically just hand out sticky notes again to everybody, and they just kind of brainstorm what to do next about the roses, about the thorns and the buds. What can we do? Um, and you create a bunch of sticky notes, and you kind of go the same process. We stick them on the board, and then you have to go up and sort of cluster them because you have a lot of repeats and figure out sort of what you have for data. And the one thing that's really cool about this process is when we're doing this with clients or even internally, right, you're gonna have a junior developer maybe their, their third or fourth week on the job in the room and possibly like the, you know, the agency chief in government or the VP of marketing in a corporate environment. 
But when you're writing things on sticky notes and putting them on the board, no one knows. You know, they all look the same. But the, the way they equal. Because you imagine if you're raising hands and talking, that junior developer is not saying a word. And you're just not saying a word with the seniors in the room. Whereas basically anything the VP says, yeah, that's it, that's a great idea. Because it's how that works. <laughs> um, so when you do it this way, you sort of level the data, you know, the, the data coming in, no one's, uh, no one's opinion is really more important than anybody else's because you really don't know. All, all you have is 85 post-it notes on a whiteboard. And then, as I said before, you take your, once you kind of grouped all your, um, we, we will do X statements, um, you kind of got rid of all the, all the, all the duplicates, you then put, you, you then just, again, we literally will draw this thing on a whiteboard with our client um, and just start, you know, okay, um, documentation. Yes, 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 you know, and kind of decide which, which quadrant it goes in. Um, and you've sort of built your project plan at that point, your first level of a project plan on how to attack this website project. Um, you know, this can be, again, this can be sort of in the day two of a four day session if we're working with a big group, or if it's sort of a smaller focused project, this can be all done in about you know four to six hours um, if you really want to push through it. I don't want that So yeah, and again, this ends up being target stuff you're going to jump on first because it's really important and relatively cheap to fix versus the luxury items, which honestly probably never get to the website because probably you spend the money on stuff that's expensive but not particularly important. So, does it work in real life? The whole point of this process is to fail early and fail often. Fail at the sticky note stage, not we built four content types and they're all wrong stage because that's much more expensive to recover from. Um, Tom Glib, who wrote uh, Principles of Software Engineering, says that once you've built your system, it's 10 times as much to fix as when you're in the design phase. And once you're in production, it's 100 times more expensive to fix than it would have been in the design phase. Um, another view of the same thing. So the whole point of this process, if you want to fail early and fail often while we're working with sticky notes and wireframes. Um, so that by the time we actually hand stuff off to the development team and they're starting to build content types and then add fields and do all that stuff, um, that we're fairly certain we know what we're doing. And obviously when we're agile, then that's another level of, you know, the ability to kind of reverse course um, a little cheaper. Um, and this is really only phase one, because in the real world, what we're going to do once we think we have the answer, before we start building anything, is we're going to validate it. We're going to do user interviews, we're going to maybe prototype it, um, and do some usability testing. Um, we're going to review what we learned with the stakeholders and kind of get that second level of validation. Here's what we learned. Does, it, does this all make sense before we start committing anything to code? So, um, just a couple of real life examples. Anyone here from Lehigh have a chance? I was doing this last year through Philadelphia and there was like four people from Lehigh in the room. <laughs> Luckily though, they agreed with everything we came out of. Um, this, by the way, it was, is their actual their actual board. So you see, they basically had everything as high value and strategic. Um, the, one of the big issues we found with them was that their marketing team and their IT team not only didn't talk much, they didn't speak the same language. Like literally, the marketing team referred to like the, how to go. Like the main navigation menu is like the main menu, and the IT team thought they were talking about something different. I mean, they literally like couldn't talk about the website together because they didn't use the same words. Um, so one of the things that came out of the session was just them developing a common language. What, what do we mean when we say main nav menu? <laughs> we're talking about the links in the left column, we're talking about the header menu. Because they didn't agree on that going into this process. MindBody, anybody ever use their app to like schedule, um, they're like a back-end ERP system for yoga studios, karate studios, oh, those types yes, of small yes, businesses. Yes. Um, we worked with them probably almost two years ago now. They had a D7 site, so it was a pretty straightforward D7 and D8 migration. But when they built their D7 site, they had come up with seven user personas. So there were essentially seven user journeys through their website. And the, one of the big problems they were having was that, you know, you and I that were having trouble with the app to schedule something. We're ending up like in the part of their site meant for their business paying users that are, you know, they're, they're building for. And the business paying users running up in the part of the site where it's for consumers using the app. So what came out of our session with them was basically, you have two personas. 
you have your paying business customers, and you have the public. Um, and if you go to their website now, it's literally the first thing you do is you self-select into am I you know one of your paying customers or am I like a consumer? And then you kind of go on the user journey through to find what you need, so that make sure that people get to the right content much easier and quicker. Um, and both of those were sort of big corporate, you know, six-figure type um, projects. This was a little bit different. Just a different example. Um, this was sort. This was a project that the American Library Association was doing. It's a website where they're helping. Oh, ELA. Uh, almost. Okay. Well, they're basically they're, they're using. They're trying to use libraries to teach kids code, basically. Um, so it's sort of it's sort of a whole it's sort of a whole program to help, help local librarians, um, you know, understand what's available and sort of how to implement these, these this, this regular code program that sort of Google funded um, for them. But we had to like launch this website. I want to say 46 days from contract signature. It, it's not big. It's like a it's like a 20 30 page website. It's not huge. But we did all these same exercises here. Here's some of the output from it. But we did it all online, like in a half a day or a couple of half day sessions. So I mean, although this is sort of generally used and most usable in big, heavy website builds, you can pull this off on a smaller project. It's really why I show this one, it's just an example of doing it on a kind of a lower budget, smaller website. Um, and for some reason, they let their they they let their um, their domain expire. The site still exists, but you have to like drill into ALA to find it. It doesn't it doesn't even redirect. I don't know if they forgot to renew it, someone stole it or what, but it's all there, but it's just hanging off ALA.org now. Um, Takeaways. Human-centered design is a process that can be learned. And you can literally go to the Lumina Institute um, and pay them, I'm assuming, thousands of dollars to become certified in it. Um, it's also called user-centered design. I mean, the basic concept um, is pretty universal and can be learned for free. You just Google it. Um, it's basically, really, when you boil it down, what it is, it's a, it's a methodology for running an effective meeting or a series of meetings. Um, and forcing you to design for users, not designers. Um, I can't draw a stick figure, but you know I can understand this stuff. So it's not something where you have to be like the creative director to get into it. Um, what comes out of it is lower risk, lower costs, and better websites or products. Um, and it drives client engagement, cross-functional collaboration, teamwork, all that stuff. And you know it's it's kind of fun compared to what you could be doing in a room full a whiteboard for four days. You know sticky noting and and, and solving problems, there's worse ways to spend a few days of meetings. Um, I'm Chris, Mindy's our creative director. She actually did most of the presentation, so I'm not sure she got credit. <laughs> if I didn't, it'd be all just a stock Google <laughs> you know, template. <laughs> not great pictures, so. Questions? Uh, do you have any tips for writing user personas? Okay, yeah, so the question is, do I have any tips for writing user personas? Um, keep them simple, I think. Is, I mean, Mindy is our expert on it, but what I've got from her is, if you have 32 attributes on the user persona, then it becomes less useful. It's really, again, to go back to the higher ed you know, thing, it's Tom is a high school, rising high school senior, depending on the college, he's either you know, a four-row student or you know, a marginal student. Um, you know, his family socioeconomic status is, you know, they're going to be well off or, you know, might be first generation college student. Really kind of pick the four or five big ones and let it go there. Because if you get more than that, then it becomes, you know, the data becomes noisy basically. Okay. But I think um, Jira now has even got her confluence, it's literally got like a user persona template oh. right, right in the software. I don't, know if, I don't know how great it is, but I've actually seen in ours. It's actually like a, st a stock now user persona template, and I think it's Confluence. Okay. This seems kind of oriented toward um, building a new site. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the principles uh, relate to uh, redesigning a site. The only thing about redesigning a site is that there's just so much stuff that you really want to remove. And I mean, I work for municipal government. Right. And get people, you know, those decision makers to say, yeah, get rid of that, you know. It uh, seems to be the hardest part. And it's just uh, carrying over, you know, thousands of pages of stuff that somebody thought was important at one point in time and you know, no longer is. I mean, I don't know if you've run into that, but you work with governments. So. Yeah, yeah, so just, uh, the question is basically how, how does this process apply to a redesign where you've basically got 15 years of sort of content history um, yeah, I mean, 
reality is all these are redesigns. I mean, the reality is, when you, especially if you go from D7 to D8, you usually don't migrate your content types by using it. You usually build a fresh site. Um, but yeah, what content should come over is a constant battle. I think I agree with you, less is, less is more. Um, but it's, it, that, that becomes a bit of a regulatory issue, right? Sometimes the government just has to have press releases from 2004 on the website available. Um, it's, and a lot of times it's just cultural. There's a, um, the city of Bloomington, Indiana, did a session at, I want to say DrupalCon Nashville, I think it was, um, where they took the Bloomington website from like 5,000 pages to 500. Um, so I, I, would go, I would go track down that, that video, um, but I think that's probably, a, I, I saw part of that session, um, and that they talk a lot about essentially how you got that done in government, how they convinced people they did not need the 2004, um, you know, Little League Sports no website anymore, whatever the case may be. <laughs> Anything else? All right.